How's it going and welcome to No Fun Lads Guide Series on Curse of Strahd, a 5th edition module. In today's video, we'll be diving into the veritable Castle Ravenloft itself. This is going to be a super duper, immense, insanely detailed series. So players do not watch this, but DMs then while added insight on how we can run this thing. Let's go ahead and start this crazy large process. Here it is. Look at all of Castle Ravenloft in all of its immense glory. This beautiful isometric map really makes this place come to life. This is reminiscent of the I-6 series Castle Ravenloft, which was this towering immense location with very large twists and turns. People got confused and people didn't understand where to go and what to do. And that was what it was designed for. It's a labyrinthian design. It's awesome. It's fun. It's unique. And we have a new rendition of it that is just so well done. And thankfully, because of the modern age, we have all of these incredible little keys and guides so that we as DMs no longer get lost. Of course, it does require a little bit of homework looking into the map to make sure that you don't get lost, but that's what we're here for. We're here to make sure that we don't get lost as our players dip around every which way. Now, this is the grand finale of this campaign, Castle Ravenloft itself. When do your players arrive to Castle Ravenloft for the very last time? Well, that entirely depends up to you. I strongly, strongly recommend that they do not show up here for the grand finale until they are at least level 10. Because if they are a lower level, they are going to be beat down by Strahd and all of his forces. There's a lot of things going on in this castle that we're going to see here. And there's just so much to keep track of, so many resources that are going to be lost, that lower levels just aren't going to be able to compete. And it's also a very fine line, because if they were to reach level 11 their power scale would shoot through the roof. People would get too strong, in my opinion, if they're level 11. And if you're not willing to go through the revisions of Strahd and the castle, then I think that a level 11 party would just be a little bit too much. So 10 is a very, very good, solid number to end this campaign on. Hopefully armed with all the items that have been foretold in their journeys, and of course with a fated ally by their side, they storm Castle Ravenloft, and let's go ahead and start looking into all of the locations, shall we? Of course, we can't forget that before you enter the castle, you have to go through the gates of Castle Ravenloft. And it's here where we get this immensely long and awesome exposition that we can give to our players. But here's the thing. That drawbridge. That drawbridge appears to be sturdy, but a few of the boards are missing. When your players make their way through here, for each one of the characters, roll a d100, and there's a 5% chance one of the boards creaks, and it breaks. And if this happens, they must make a DC 10 dexterity saving throw, or fall 1,000 feet. If any companion is within 5 feet, they have advantage on the saving throw. So, I'm not going to lie, having a PC go through this entire campaign, and then dying because of a 5% chance, is both hilarious and very, very terrible. If you are running a campaign that is reminiscent of old school D&D, keep it as is. But something tells me that a lot of people wouldn't sit kindly with that in today's day and age. And here is the map that you should go ahead and show off to your players once they start walking toward the castle. This is what they're going to see from first up here. They're going to see this incredibly large and super detailed out location. They can see that the tallest tower reaches up a whole 360 feet. My goodness, this tower is crazy tall. And once they make their way into that open courtyard, you can go ahead and show off a bit of this map here if they start meandering about the place. You can show off the architectural, just grand design of this location, of how immensely beautiful this place is, and most importantly, once was. At one point, this place must have been the bell of the ball. Unfortunately, of course, uh, things are a little bit overgrown, and once they make their way inside, they'll be able to see that the place isn't exactly up to snuff. In Area 1, the front courtyard, once your players make their way past that drawbridge, there they'll be able to see the magnificent design of this castle. And they'll also be able to see these sprawling walls here. The walls that enclose the courtyard are 90 feet high. Ridiculous. And as your players begin to look around, they'll be able to see that main entrance to the castle itself. But if they start walking around, they'll also be able to discover that there are some side entrances. And your players may be curious and decide to start walking around. Now something I should totally, totally dive into here is 
you need to set the theme and tone for this location. Thick, cold fog swirls in this courtyard. Sporadic flashes of lightning glance the weeping clouds overhead as thunder shakes the ground. Make them feel like they are truly entering Dracula's castle, right? Make them feel like the world is against them. This place is ominous and creepy and the outside is harsh and bitter. And at some point they'll retreat to the inside, but there inside they'll discover that Maybe it was better outside. And as always, I'm gonna go ahead and say that James RPGR can really make this come to life. Especially if you go over to his Patreon and you see that animated version of this. The lightning cracking down, the rain falling overhead. Oh, so great. So great. Always, always use James RPGR. And uh, mind you, James has dived into many of the locations inside of Castle Ravenloft itself. So I'm gonna be showing those off whenever it is necessary. In area two here, we have the center court gate. Your players begin to walk around the castle itself, and yeah, they'll be able to make their way through here because the gates have been unlocked and can be lifted with a successful DC 15 strength check. Unless the portcullis is wedged or propped open, however, it falls back into place once it is let go. So if for some reason your players have to make a quick getaway, it's, you know, you definitely have to have something there just in case. In area three, the servant's courtyard, your players will be able to look around and see that this place apparently had a carriage house and a wooden door that resides on the side there. Your players will probably be able to pick up on the fact that this was for the servants or for other such purposes and be able to look around. A character can shoulder open the stuck door with a DC 10 strength check. Pretty easy. In area four, the carriage house, literally nothing special about it at all. However, you should go ahead and show off the fact that there are multiple carriages in here, not just the one, because if for some strange reason your players get the audacity to destroy some of these carriages, then, you know, maybe Strahd needs to have a fleet of carriages, and that's definitely something that should be taken into account. In Area 5, the Chapel Garden, we know that directly there to the side is the chapel itself. If your players begin to make their way through here, they'll be able to look around and see that these large iron gates squeak loudly on rusted hinges when opened. Beyond them lies Area 6, and that is the Overlook. If they know the topography of Castle Ravenloft, that it's built basically on a precarious rock, they may think to themselves like, ooh, this is kind of scary, but let's go ahead and look to see, because there's obviously something there. It is in Area 6, the Overlook, when your players peer over the balcony here, they can see the dismal village of the village of Barovia. And you can only imagine how many times Strahd has overlooked, you know, this poor village and probably chuckled a little about how terrible their lives are. However, if people are astute enough, they'll be able to recognize that there is something directly underneath the Overlook. And we know that that is, in fact, the crypts of his dear old mommy and daddy. So if people go over to this overlook and they see, oh, hey, you know, there is actually something down there. Maybe we can actually get to it. Well, yeah, people can go down there. It's totally an option. However, you have to be very careful with this one because characters who try to reach the windows of the overlook must descend 110 feet and move 20 feet back, right? So they got to be, you know, just moving down. And anybody who falls here falls 1,000 feet. So, realistically, yeah, they can go ahead and if they've got a bunch of rope, they can do it. But if they are using rope, then all it takes is one vindictive monster to just cut that rope and everyone dies. So hopefully if people use something clever, such as, I don't know pitons and more rope or hopefully just magic and something we're going to see quite a lot here is the fortunes of ravenloft more specifically in regards to where your players will be able to find strahd if your card reading indicates that they encounter strahd here he is looking out over the balcony so something i'm going to be getting into later on specifically it'll be another series besides the castle ravenloft is the strahd monologues i think that there is a merit to having a strahd monologue depending on the location that he is at. A perfect example being, you know, just a quick little flash here, is if Strahd is found here, then maybe he can be lamenting over the plight of the village of Barovia and, you know, relating that to, to his own plight and saying, oh, they suffer as I have suffered, but I have suffered far greater and far longer than they have. I'm going to do a whole, whole thing. Do not worry about that, but that will be a series after the Castle Ravenloft one. So here was once again, you know, just showing off more of the location that they can see. So here's the thing. 
No fun allowed, you cry. I can't run a game in an isometric map. I just can't do it. Well, thankfully, if you bought this on Roll20, you get the map. The actual battle map. Now look at that. Here is the full two-scale battle map that has been provided on Roll20. And my oh my, does it work. Look at it. It's already to scale. You can see off all the locations here. You can see that some of the tokens have already been placed. It is excellent. There's keys here. There's everything. It's colored. It's beautiful. But the thing is, is you only get this if you bought it on Roll20. Many of you probably have bought the book in the book alone, in which case you do not have this map. I'm going to provide a link down below to the DMs Guild rendition of this map. And I promise you, between the DMs Guild, the Reddit, and the Discord, you can easily find a map that suits your preferred needs. And now we are on to when your players finally decide to make their way through those first front doors to Castle Ravenloft. It is here when your players make their way inside. They're going to be immersed into this crazy wonderland of awesomeness. This map is just so well done. The just, oh, just everything about it is just absolutely fantastic. And this is just an absolute delight to go through. You are going to have a blast running this thing. Your players are going to have a blast exploring this thing. It is just so well done. So before we dive into the locations here, I wanted to get into the random encounters table. The first time a character enters a castle area that isn't otherwise occupied, check for a random encounter. Also, check for a random encounter every 10 minutes the characters spend resting in the castle. Meaning that if your players try to take a long rest in the castle, there is next to no chance that there isn't a random encounter. It's next to impossible. <laughs> because, you know, you roll a d20, and on an 18 or a higher, they're going to get a random encounter. This is very reminiscent of old school D&D, where your players are exploring around and they're going up against the dungeon. The dungeon does not want the party to live. The dungeon wants to kill the PCs. But thankfully, we are given these random encounters that aren't necessarily deathly or hostile immediately. So, I just want to go over a few of these just to go ahead and show off what is going on here in this castle. So much like the random encounter table in the Lands of Barovia, we don't get a straight D20 table or D100 or anything. We get a D12 plus a D8. Pretty unique here. On a 2, your players will find Esmeralda. Esmeralda is naturally chasing after Strahd, but she isn't able to track him down. Esmeralda will actually join the party if she hasn't already done so already. If your players already have Esmeralda as their fated ally, or if they just manage to bring Esmeralda along for this fight, then of course treat this encounter like it's nothing. Or, one of my strong recommendations is you go ahead and change up this whole random encounter table. Now something to mention about this random encounter table is look at what your players are going up against. A black cat, a broom of animated attack, several flying swords, an unseen servant, some crawling claws, etc, etc. A lot of these encounters are very trivial, especially for a level 10 party. You know, they aren't necessarily designed to kill the party. What they are designed for is to spend resources. That is the kind of crux of D&D, specifically 5e, is that they're trying to get you to spend your resources over time. That means that, you know, the early fights are going to be easy, but the later fights are going to be harder. That's what Strahd wants. Strahd wants the players to spend their resources on the weak and the chaff so that he has a much better time when he goes to finally fight the party. Now, a lot of people have a lot of different mentalities on how they want to challenge their players if they just want to have big, one, huge, epic, ridiculous, awesome combat, or if they want to peter out multiple combats throughout the day. This is designed to have those multiple combats throughout the day because that is what 5e was built upon. You're supposed to have you know, six to eight encounters in a day. Obviously, this is going to amount to a lot more if your players spend a lot of time crawling around Castle Ravenloft. So, really comes down to your individual preference. I strongly recommend that if you are looking for a bit more of a meteor challenge, then you go ahead and look upon the DMs Guild, the Discord, and the Reddit, because there is a lot of awesome random encounters to be found there. A lot of people have come up with a lot of crazy, awesome ideas. Like I said before, these things aren't terribly challenging to higher level parties. Specifically, if they go up against one Barovian Witch, they're going to kill her in a single round. They go up against one Strahd Zombie, they're going to kill a zombie in a single round, right? It really, you know, depends on the group that you have and the kind of game and tempo that you're running. And also, also something very fun and interesting to note is that, theoretically, 
your players could bump into Strahd early on. It is possible. Your players could know for a fact that they have to find Strahd in da-da-da, so-and-so such place. But theoretically, Strahd could just show up at any time because on a 20, they find him. And Strahd just does what he does. He says, good evening, and then just starts beating the crap out of everybody. So for the sake of this series, I will be bouncing around between the isometric maps and the top-down maps just so everyone gets a feel of the dimensions of this area. That is something that is really, really tough for everyone to deal with, the dimensions of this area, specifically the verticality of it. You are going to have to sit there and recognize what staircases lead to what area because whether you're playing in person or on a virtual tabletop, Playing this is really tough because you have to immediately transfer over, you know, many, many pages or switch over to different maps. And you got to be ready and on the fly with that because, you know, like I said, there is a lot going on here. And depending on how fast the party is going, that may or may not be a hindrance to you. So when your players arrive and they decide to make their way through those double doors for the first time, they arrive in Area 7, the Entry. And if they arrive, they'll see that the doors will fling wide open for them. And inside, they'll hear the sound of an organ playing. Pretty auspicious stuff. Now, something very important here is overhead in the vaulted entry foyer, four statues of dragons glare down, their eyes flickering in the torchlight. These aren't just any sort of ordinary gargoyles. These are red dragon wormlings. And unfortunately, they're pretty freaking strong. So there is four of these creatures that have a plus six to hit, that do a d10 plus four of damage and an additional 1d6 damage. And they also have this fire breath attack, which does 7d6 points of damage, 17 AC, 75 HP. This is actually a tough one right from the get-go. But of course, they don't immediately attack. That's the important thing you got to consider here, is that they don't immediately just jump down and jump the party. No. They allow anyone to make their way through here, especially if they've been invited to dinner. But if anyone tries to leave this area, that is when the dragons are going to jump down from their perch, and that is when things are going to go very, very bad. Something important to note here, though, is that they are very, very strong. In particular, when they are in that gargoyle-type form there, you know, looking like statues, they are impervious to damage. That is very good to know. So the dragons, basically, if they're just sitting there and your players attack, yeah, nothing's going to happen to them. But if they do jump down, then they are just ordinary dragons and can be damaged as such. In Area 8, your players will be in the Great Entry, and it's here where they'll be able to see the sad, forlorn nature of this location. About all these cobwebs drawn all about, and sadly, you know, this place has fallen into ruin and decay. They'll also be able to spot that there is eight gargoyles that are all glaring down at them. Pretty creepy stuff. However, what is very cool here is that when they arrive in here, an elf is going to show up, quiet as a cat, Rahadin. He's going to say, my master is expecting you. He's going to be coming down from that staircase to the left, and he will just start marching past the party and guide the players to Strahd. If you have players that are willing to bite... Haha, <laughs> if you have players that are willing to go ahead and go along with this, then it's a pretty cool encounter because especially if they've been invited to dinner, you know, it makes sense. If they are being cordial, they get shown to the dinner room and there they'll be able to meet Strahd. Rahadin, however, is not going to natively stick around. Rahadin simply shows them to the dining room and then makes his way back to his own private room. I've already done a whole video about dinner with Strahd, and I seriously think that there are some other things you can do to really spice the thing up. But if you're running it more along the lines of as written, then, you know, it makes sense. Rahadin's just going to show him the door and then go ahead and make his way back to his own area. So what's really in particular scary here is once your players leave this area, once again, the gargoyles don't attack because they've been invited. But if the players return, that is when those gargoyles are going to swoop down. And a very, very cool aspect of this fight is when the gargoyles attack, the turbulence in the air from their wings extinguishes the feeble torches in their sconces, plunging the hall into utter darkness, unless the characters have a light source on them. That is really, really cool, right? Your players, you look around, this place is dingy, you can, they can barely see anything, and all of a sudden, in the middle of a fight that's about to ensue, the place plunges into darkness. So awesome. So fitting. Especially if there's lightning crackling beyond. Oh, just just so, so, so thematic. So great. 
in Area 9, the Guest Hall, your players will be able to march up here, especially if they're being led by Ra Hadin. And it's here where they'll be able to see that there is more to this area. They can see right from the get-go, as soon as they enter Castle Ravenloft, they see a grand staircase up to the left. They see that there's a set of double doors right in front of them. And they'll be able to go to the right there. And they'll be able to see not only another set of double doors, which leads to the dining hall, but they'll also be able to look down and see that there's another staircase. And that staircase, not only does it lead up, but it also leads down. So they are already spoiled for a ton of options here. They know that once they start exploring around this area, there is so many directions in which way to go. What is interesting here though is your players will be able to see a suit of armor standing in the alcove. And that suit of armor standing there is actually a normal suit of plate armor that is well to care for. Normally when you see suits of armor around, they are you know just a fake metal and purely ornamental. But the fact that it is a real plate armor does indicate that if people were willing to take the time, especially if they had the right build for it, they could go ahead and adorn this plate armor on them, and that could be a nice little bump to anyone's AC. In Area 10, we have the Dining Hall. Once again, this James RPG art just sells it, right? Your players get led by Rahadeen, they open up the door, and then they hear the bail of this organ. They'll be able to see this magnificent feast. They'll be able to see a roaring fireplace, and this place just looks so beautiful, so good. And they'll be able to hear the thunderous melody. You know, just, ah, oh, it fits so well, so great. So when they arrive, they may be a little bit tentative of what's going on here, especially if Rahadin just closes the door and starts walking away. They'll be able to see Strahd, except we of course know that it isn't Strahd. That is in fact an illusion. This Strahd illusion is simply playing this organ to his heart's content and luring the players into this deathly trap. Should your players decide to talk to Strahd, they can gleam a little bit of information that Strahd desires. However, Strahd will not talk about any useful information about it, the inhabitants, the treasures, or the dangers, or anything else of Castle Ravenloft. After a few moments, the Strahd illusion is going to disappear and do so with a mocking laugh. And he will also disappear if the players decide to try and attack him. The moment the figure disappears, a fierce bone-chilling wind rises up and roars through the hall, putting out all open flames. So if you have players that have torches out, then they get sputtered out too, and that's pretty cool. The characters hear the screech of ancient hinges and the solid thud of many doors slamming shut, one after another into the distance. They also hear the porcullus clang shut and the tired groan of the aged drawbridge pulling up. They are now in castle ravenloft and they cannot leave that is just such a great moment your players may have some expectations of what's going on here but i'm willing to bet that no one was thinking that's going to happen that the poor colas gets lowered the drawbridge gets raised and they cannot escape castle ravenloft not without some sort of magical feat so should your players decide to look around this room they'll actually be able to discover that the organ actually holds a secret wall your players can look with a DC 20 perception check, notice that there are scratch marks on the floor. And if they press some of the pedals on the organ, they can feel that the organ can move. Should they be able to move it around, they'll be able to see it leads to area 11, the South Archer's Post. And as a fun little addition right there at the very end there, the food on the table is tasty, the wine delicious. More often than not, most people are going to think it's a trap or an illusion, but it is real. And I think that is very telling of the character that Strahd is. The fact that he invites these people to dinner, literally plans on killing them, but hey, he's going to give them some nice food and drink in the meantime. I think that's very, very thematic. In Area 11 here, we have the South Archer's Post. Should your players arrive here either through the secret door or they make their way through the castle, they'll be able to see this interesting location. The fact that there is leaning against the wall mirrors of various sizes. And that is, once again, telling of this world. When Strahd turned into a vampire, what use did he have for mirrors? In fact, he probably wouldn't like to have mirrors because they would probably remind him of his terrible dark past. So he ordered all the mirrors to be removed, and the mirrors got moved to this location out of sight from him. In area 12 here, we have the turret post. Your players, once again, if they arrive here either through the secret door or just through this area, they'll be able to look outside, and yes, they will be able to see outside. But the thing is, is that the arrow slits are only 4 inches wide. So without the use of magic, no one would be able to escape. In area 13, we have the turret post access hall. Go ahead and describe how unused this place is. The fact that no one has used this thing in centuries and cobwebs just fill the hall, obstructing sight beyond a few feet. 
you know, that is pretty cool. That makes this place feel like, oh man, like, you know, some of the other parts of the castle get used, but this place isn't, you know, is there a reason why this place doesn't get used? Ugh. In area 14 here, we have the Hall of Faith. Your players make their way through here, presumably after dealing with those gargoyles, or potentially if they made their way through the chapel, if they, you know, took a whole another route. They come to here, and they'll be able to see that there is the, all these life-size statues, and the statues appear to be watching them. This is merely just a harmless illusion, but your players may get a little jumpy and go ahead and start beating up on some poor statues. You know, no big loss, right? But what is cool is, appearing above the doors that lead to Area 15, the chapel, they'll be able to see a symbol of beaten bronze that looks like a rising or setting sun. Obviously, you know, some religious stuff for that good old morning lord that used to be worshipped oh so long ago in Castle Ravenloft, but probably doesn't get much love nowadays. In Area 15 here, we have the chapel. This is just a beautiful location, or at least it once was beautiful. The chapel looks a little bit like this. It is just, at one point, it must have held such grand beauty, especially once the sun shone through, and of course there was no cobwebs all about. But of course, there they can see, right there, that there is an altar, and there is more here than meets the eye. Here they'll be able to find the slumped over remains of a one Gustav Herengast, an evil human cleric who tried to obtain the icon of Ravenloft and did not survive the attempt. Now why didn't he survive? Well you see, the icon of Ravenloft is a item and unfortunately any evil creature that touches the statue must succeed on a DC 17 constitution saving throw or take 16 D10 radiant damage on a failed saving throw or take half as much on a success. So that's a pretty big deal. The statue, however, is safe for all creatures to handle once it is no longer in contact with the altar. And of course, if you are not an evil character, you can just pick it up no problem. The icon of Ravenloft looks like this. It looks like some sort of bishop individual that is seen there praying. This thing is a pretty awesome item. While within 30 feet of the icon, a creature under the effect of protection from evil and good spell against fiend and undead. Only a creature attuned to the icon can use its other properties, however. You can use the augury feature, and it basically just casts augury without the use of the components and can be used once a day. The Bane of Undead. You can use this icon as a holy symbol to turn the undead and increase the save DC by 2. So you can, you know, sit there and rebuke the undead. You know, that's pretty cool. And third, you can cure wounds. So you can use an action to heal anyone within 30 feet of you, and they regain 3d8 plus 3 HP, unless they're undead, a construct, or fiend. Once used, it cannot be used again this way until next dawn. So a pretty awesome item, requires a tombment, obviously, and it must be of a creature of good alignment. So alignment is a thing that's not in everybody's campaigns. A lot of people shun the idea of, you know, alignments and stuff, and that's perfectly fine. So what I would go ahead and recommend is if you do not have alignment in your campaign of that degree and then just base it off of the asshole meter if they're an asshole then they get zapped and if they're not an asshole then problem solved they can just go ahead and use it easy peasy gustav however was not naked in this whole event he had an awesome cloak that is worth 250 gp a suit of chainmail, and he also held a mace of terror which can totally be used freaking awesome and what's really cool is if your card reading leads you here to find the treasure, it lies right there on the floor next to the altar. And if your card reading indicates that Strahd is here, he is among the bats in the rafters. Or he's standing at the end of the chapel, a dark shape in a vast hall. Once again, I will be doing a whole series based on the card readings and all that fun stuff, so that will be covered at a later time. Woo, 15 areas down only, oh gosh, so many more to go. 86 whole locations in this castle, but every single one of them is teeming with life to some degree because something's gonna pop out or you know your players are gonna make something of it. This place is an absolute delight and I cannot wait to hear your guys' thoughts on Castle Ravenloft about all the awesome and epic stories you plan on having or already have. Go ahead and tell me what you've done to Castle Ravenloft to make this dead place come to life because I want to know. That is going to do it for me though. Thank you so much for watching and thank you to all my awesome patrons up here. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.